Lecture 48 in Handout Theology, Justification, Part 1. 1. Faith is the heart of salvation, and here is why. It brings justification. 2. And this was the heart of the Reformation. 3. For Luther, this was the article or doctrine by which the church stands or falls. For, for John Calvin, it was the, quote, hinge of the Reformation. And Roman Catholicism, though opposing it, agreed on its cruciality. Five, the Protestant church stood on it, and the Roman church at the Council of Trent, 1546 to 63, fell by rejecting it. Six, the doctrine being so inseparable for Christianity, from Christianity, let us make sure we understand it. And here I give a little diagrammatic outline of the four main interpretations. One, the liberal, which teaches that works bring justification minus faith without any faith being necessary. Two, the antinomian view that faith brings justification without any works being necessary. The Roman Catholic is that faith plus works brings justification, and the Protestant biblical view, faith brings justification plus works. Eight, liberalism is anti-supernatural Christianity, as we've said, a contradiction in terms because Christianity is founded on a supernatural person, Jesus Christ, and His supernatural Word, the Bible. Nevertheless, liberalism, though it is anti-Christian, makes up the largest number, the nominal Christians. Its way of justification is entirely by what you do. Salvation by works, pure and simple, a do-it-yourself religion. Liberalism is for practice, not faith, deed, not creed, life, not doctrine. In the diagram we write minus faith, not meaning that liberalism is opposed to faith in general, but to faith in Christ as a divine person and His atonement as a divine work. Nine, antinomianism, widespread in fundamentalism, believes in a supernatural Christ and supernatural Bible without any question, but it stresses by faith alone in such a way that the works which must follow need not. Notwithstanding, there is supposed to be justification by faith. This is anti-biblical and anti-justification because faith without works is dead, James 2, 26. And finally, on to Roman justification in the next lecture. But first of all, faith is the heart of salvation, and here is why it brings justification. We gave you several lectures, you know, on faith, and because it's absolutely indispensable, it is the point at which you come in saving contact, actual union with Christ. That's the reason it brings all its blessings, and its great blessing is justification being brought right by the removal of sin and the endowment of righteousness with God. Number two, historically speaking, this was the heart of the Reformation also. You see, in the Reformation time, there was no great debate about the Bible because the Roman church believed in its inspiration just as truly as the Protestant church did. The difference there was the matter of the authority of interpretation, but not the book itself. There was no debate about the Trinity because the existing church believed in that as much as the Protestant church actually did. They all agreed on the virgin birth, on the incarnation, on the death of Christ on the cross as a sacrifice. They even believed in the necessity and faith. They differed on the justification by faith alone 
as we'll see more particularly. As I say here in three, for Luther, this was the doctrine by which the church stands or falls. He used to say he, he'd take the Pope if he could have salvation by grace. He didn't like that particular type of church government. And when he visited Rome, he was sickened by some of the things that went on there. But he wasn't so hostile to the concept of papacy that he couldn't have lived with that if he could have had justification by faith alone. And in the early days of his Reformation activity, he really believed. The reason the Pope was opposing it was because the Pope wasn't well informed. And he rather hopefully expected that when he and others made that doctrine clearer, the head of the Church of Rome would recognize that's the Bible truth and vindicate Luther and he would become St. Martin rather than excommunicated from the church of the time. But this was indispensable. He would keep the papacy if he could have justification, but if he couldn't have justification with the papacy, the papacy and everything else had to go because this was non-negotiable. This is the way of salvation. You're not going to come to God any other way. Here I stand, you see. Number four, for John Calvin, who stood really on Luther's shoulder, who learned the gospel indirectly through Luther, but was much more of a student of the Bible once he did than even Luther was, it too, in his opinion, was the hinge of the Reformation. It all turned essentially on this. He wrote a great dissertation on the necessity of reforming the church. And he made many criticisms on the claims of Rome to having authority that he didn't think it had and misinterpretations of the sacraments and great abuses of celibacy and matters like that. But he too would have agreed with Martin Luther that justification by faith was the heart of the matter. Luther had said, you know, that earlier reformers had tried to trim the branches, but he had put the ax at the root of the tree which is justification by faith alone. Calvin never used that language, but he shared that viewpoint, if I understand him at all correctly. He did a good deal of the trimming of the branches, but he would have agreed with Luther that the ax had to be put at the root of the tree. This was a fatal fall. This wasn't calling just for cosmetic surgery. This had to be a change of heart if any Christianity was to be preserved. Number five, the Protestant church stood on it and the Roman church at the Council of Trent, 1546 to 63, fell by rejecting it. The opinion of Luther and Calvin and all the other reformers. You see what happened here, 1546, you may notice, is the very date of Luther's death. 63 is a year before Calvin died. So you can see that Rome is facing the Reformation and the issues it raised, including and recognizing as central this matter of justification. Now by the time the major reformers have left the scene, Roman Catholicism has rejected the Reformation root and branch, but especially root at this particular matter of justification, which in everybody's Protestant's opinion was essential to the existence of the church. There couldn't be any salvation without it, and there couldn't be any church without salvation, so it had to be. And when Rome refused to be reformed, refused to acknowledge the error of opposing it, and actually rejected Protestantism doctrine as the error itself, then Rome fell into the state of a non-church and not a proclaimer of the faith. Some changes are going on at the present time. I don't have time to give you a <coughs> historical lecture on this subject. I'll let it drop with this simple remark about the present situation. It looks as if the two churches are coming together again and actually are agreeing on justification. That's a ruse. That's merely on the facade. It's a farce. 
There is no real meeting of the issues. I sometimes say what's going on here are Roman Catholics who aren't Roman Catholics talking with Protestants who aren't Protestants and, of course, having perfect agreement without touching the issue at all. No one can dispute that the Protestant churches, including the Lutheran, seem to be moving toward an acceptance of the Roman view and the Roman acceptance of the Lutheran view. And the opinion of this particular historian you are now listening to, that's a farce. It isn't real at all. There is no true facing of the question. Actually, what is happening is that the Protestant church has fallen away from the doctrine so badly that they can't really see the difference with the Roman view, and Rome doesn't really understand in the representatives who are arguing the case for her what the heart of the Reformation issue was. I'll have to leave it with that. Uh, you may doubt it because it is such a summary comment about a tradition that's been going on for decades now that look as if on the surface of it there is a genuine rapprochement. Six, the doctrine being so inseparable from Christianity, let us make sure we understand it. So with that little bit of historical resume, let's look now at the doctrine itself. And here I have presented it in terms of these four uh, diagrams, which I believe are generally accurate, though they have, of course, the inevitable limitations of a diagram for something as profound as the doctrine of justification by faith alone. I'd say the liberal view, and I would take time for the liberal view because even though liberalism ought not to be in the church, as I've said a half a dozen times, it is in the church, and it's numerically the greatest, and it has its views, and this is what's being spread as the idea of salvation or justification where they know the name and so on by liberalism. Works bring salvation or justification minus faith. Now, I've already said before that that doesn't mean that they're opposed to faith. They believe in faith. They're always talking about faith. What they are opposed to is faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, which is what is meant by justification by faith alone. Therefore, you have to be careful when you're listening to liberals talk about their view. They would sound as if they believe in justification by faith alone, and they could be quite outraged at my representing them as not believing in faith. I know they believe in faith, but they don't believe in the faith which the church thinks justified. They reject that out of hand. They don't believe as liberals that Jesus Christ is the virgin-born Son of God. They don't believe he's any second person in the Trinity. They don't believe he shed blood for the remission of sin. That kind of faith is utterly repugnant to them. So when they talk about faith, it ought to be put in quotes, they're talking about faith in the fact that the sun will rise tomorrow or in the marital vows of a spouse or something like that. They are not talking about this thing at all. The only kind of gospel they know is a works gospel. It's a do-it-yourself religion, as I mentioned there. You should, if you're a Christian, follow in the footsteps of Jesus. You should do what's right. You should practice the golden rule. You should love your enemies. You should go the second mile and, and turn the other cheek and so on. All of these things are quite true. All of these things are right, but these things are the ones which actually justify you or make you acceptable to God. They rarely use the word justification. But when we're talking about how we are acceptable to God in the opinion of the liberal, we're born well, and as long as we continue to do what we ought to, live according to our conscience, and observe the golden rule, we are pleasing to God. We are acceptable to God. We are justified by God. Let me tell you an experience I had just to make you realize, in case you don't already, though I suppose you do, that this attitude that I'm describing here, the liberal view of justification, get very widespread in Orthodox churches, churches which ought to know better 
And we're talking, you remember now, about the doctrine by which the church stands or falls, the doctrine by which an individual stands or falls. And I'm saying now, and I'm going to illustrate in a moment, that this particular doctrine, which is an absolute travesty on the biblical doctrine and what Luther and Calvin lived and died for and so on, has percolated through to the rank and file and people who would be reared not as liberals, but as conservatives, evangelicals, and even reformed, and so on, are talking this way. The thing I'm thinking of is this. One time years ago in Omaha, Nebraska, I was to supply the pulpit in a Protestant church. I got there a little bit early in time for the Sunday school, and so they asked me if I would be willing to teach the Sunday school class of these young couples about 30 of them there, 15 or so couples. I said, I'd be glad to, and I got some papers, and I distributed them to the people, and I asked them to do one thing for me. Write down on the paper, what is the heart of Christianity? Not this truth or that truth or the other truth, but what is the gospel? What's the very central message of the Christian religion? What's the good news? Just write in your own language, sign the paper if you want, it doesn't matter to me. You just tell me what you as individual professing young Christians in a church where the pastor was a very faithful minister of the Word understood the heart of the Christian religion to be. Now I got about 30 replies back. 28 of those told me about the golden rule the going the second mile, the loving people, the doing good to people, and so on. All of the things they mentioned, not lying, being honest, fair, kind, and so on. Every one of them was a teaching of the Christian religion. But there were only two in that group who said anything at all about salvation by grace, who even mentioned the good news. What they were talking about was simply this duty and that duty and the other, but that they were justified by faith alone, the real heart of the religion, that were saved by Christ laying down his life, washing away his, our guilt in his blood, that got on two out of 30 papers, that particular type of thing. Now, mind you, that was a conservative church, conservative pastor in the pulpit. Boy, I, I take a minute to say something at one time. I had my father-in-law, who was an evangelical pastor, visiting with us, and he got into a conversation with our next-door neighbor, who was a member of the church of which I was the pastor. And since the conversation went on right under my study window, I couldn't help hearing it. And you know what I heard? I heard my parishioner, who had been sitting under my instruction for about two years, telling my father-in-law that salvation was by works. And when my father-in-law tried to tell him about the gospel, oh, no, 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 no. I had been teaching the gospel. I had thought I had articulated it clearly and emphatically. And you know me because I wasn't teaching anything essentially different then than I'm now. With you and so on, I would never have given anybody the impression that he's saved by doing this and doing that and doing the other thing, but by trust in Christ alone, though he'd do all those other things. And there is the man with great conviction telling my father-in-law that the heart of the gospel is the doing this and doing that, just as if he were an arch-liberal, and he had learned that from my father-in-law's son-in-law, so on. There you are, see. How easy it is to go into the liberal pattern on this matter. So I'm saying to you, as I presume are mostly conservative people listening to these tapes, ask yourself, what are you trusting in? What do you understand the gospel to be? So much for liberalism. Let's look at antinomianism before we finish this part of the lecture here. Antinomianism has this particular pattern. Faith brings Justification minus works. We call this officially antinomianism because it means against the lawism. 
It means it's against the idea of the works of the law or the acts of obedience being uh, necessary. It's called easy believism because believing in Christ, you are justified without doing anything at all. And that you are justified at this moment, even if you never do a good work in your entire life. Now, this, you understand, is not only not liberal, it is anti-liberal. These people are fundamentalists always. They believe in real faith. They believe in a virgin-born Son of God who shed His blood for the remission of sins, and they are singing constantly about there being power in the blood and all those glorious, emphatic statements in music and in testimony and so on that Jesus died, and we glory in the cross, and our salvation is by Him alone, and nothing in my hands I bring will make you feel very, very good because these people get the message about Christ and faith in Jesus Christ, and they recognize that that brings justification. You don't contribute anything to it, you see. It's Christ with whom you're united by faith who is the justifier. Nothing in my, oh, they love that hymn. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. These people are fundamentalists, they're evangelicals, they believe all the things that liberalism rejects. And as such, there are brothers of ours, but at the same, and sisters, but at the same time, minus works. Now here again, we have to understand what that means. That doesn't mean that uh, the works refer to serving Christ, preaching Christ, spreading the gospel about Christ, trying to win people to Christ, doing good for people, etc. all the acts. That this particular thing, they're talking about works just all the rest of us talk about. Honesty and integrity and kindness and going the second mile and so on. But when they say minus here, they don't mean they're hostile to them. They don't mean that it's wrong to practice them. But what they mean is that though you ought to practice them, and it's a duty to practice them, and that you'll get a reward if you practice them, and that if you don't practice them, you'll be saved so as by fire, and you'll really be embarrassed before the judgment seat of Christ, but you'll be saved without them. That they will say. So understand me here. They're not against works. In a sense, they're for them, and many of them work. Why do they roll up their sleeves? They really labor for the advancement of the gospel as they know it. But what they mean by this minus is it is not necessary. There's one thing these people will not take, they will not accept, and that is the idea that the works are necessary. That's the battle word. That's the code term. You tell these people that it is necessary for you to engage in acts of obedience to Jesus Christ, or you are not justified, they will be fighting mad. Now, some of them are capable, in spite of their anger at this point, of listening academically, as it were. Now, I remember once I was with a group out there in, in Colorado, a group of very bright young people, and discussing this in connection with the Reformation, they were Sharpies, they were college students and bright ones engaged in conservative Christian work. And for about two hours in one of the classes, we didn't do anything but just discuss this one point. I was maintaining works are absolutely necessary if you are to be saved. And they were fighting me every inch of the way but before the thing was over, they finally realized, and it was very hard to admit it, that they really did agree with me, yes. And this is what I was showing to them. See, the reason they resisted it, the reason all fundamentalists uh, uh, who do resist it resist it, is because they think that when you say the works are necessary, you th they think that you necessarily assume that they are contributing to your justification. And I was saying to them, no, no, no. 
Justification is by faith alone, but the Bible is insisting that faith without works is dead. This is, in other words, a working faith. It's faith, but it's a true faith. It's a working faith. And if it isn't a working faith, there's no justification. If those works are not there, not contributing to justification, but a definite expression of the reality of the faith, which is a working faith, then it's not a working faith. It's a dead faith. And if it's a dead faith, no one is going to be justified by a dead faith. As I say, it took two hours of grinding, careful, close analysis, what the students used to call being put on the hot seat by Gershner. I just made them think it through, and they were not willing for a moment to say when they once faced it that it was possible for an individual to believe truly in Jesus Christ unless he was giving evidence of it. And once they got it clearly in their mind that that's all that we're saying that's involved in faith, true faith, it has to be working faith so that work is there, and if the works are not there, this isn't here. If that isn't there, this isn't here, and this isn't here. You see how very important this is. You see, as I say, I always feel kind of tenderness toward my conservative friends who differ here. On the other hand, I get even angrier with them because, uh, than I do with the liberals because the liberals are lost souls. They're just out in no man's land. They don't conjure with the Bible at all. But here are people who live and die by the Bible, nevertheless teaching something which actually cuts the heart out of the cross. Here again, I've said about one as theologian here who actually will defend this sort of thing. His fundamental problem is he cannot understand the difference between necessary work and meritorious work. We are saying these works are necessary, not that they have any value in actually saving a person. They don't have any merit. The merit is all in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. And I say, if a person can't understand the difference between necessary works and meritorious works, he may be a Christian, but he ought never to be in a Christian pulpit. This is a false gospel. The idea that a person can be saved, and maybe I can squeeze this one remark in before we have to end this lecture just to show you how this thing can be carried out realistically in dreadful deeds that are associated nevertheless with a true Christian state. One time when I was lecturing at a Christian college, I won't mention because I don't think the college believes this or champion this at all. Nevertheless, I was more or less on this subject and somebody somewhere or other got a note, a th sort of three by five card, circulating up to me, some very circuitous route had ultimately gotten the dean's hand up on the platform, and even while I was speaking, it was given to me, and this is what it said. Apparently, I was supposed to read it while I was lecturing. Somebody was registering a vivid protest. This is what it said. I am having sex with this girl every day. I'm not married with her. I'm having sex with her every day. I have been born again by the Holy Spirit, and I have the joy of the Lord in my life. See? Because he was justified by faith. The fact that he was living in open defiance of the will of God, showing by his avowed behavior that he didn't have any faith at all, because he was living on this proposition that it was possible to have faith without any works, he not only devoid of works, but actually practicing the grossest kind a violation of the commandment of Jesus Christ was yet wanting me to know he had been born again and he had the joy of the Lord in his heart. That's just how serious this thing can be. Now, obviously, a person like that has not been born again. He is not justified by faith. If he doesn't repent, he will most certainly perish. God grant that none of you will fall into any such trap as this.